Okay, welcome everybody to the seminar on arithmetic geometry and quantum field theory. The, uh, today, it's a great pleasure to have Katrin Ventland uh, from Freiburg, and she's going to tell us uh, uh, about the uh, um, topic listed, uh, written on the screen, counting half and quarter BPS states and their geometric counterparts. Thank you, Katrin, it's over to you. So thank you very much, Minjo, for inviting me to speak at this uh, seminar. It's a great honor. And at the same time, I have to say I'm not very experienced with these virtual talks. So please bear with me if I make a mess with the transparencies. I'm going to try not to, but uh, let's see how it goes. Well, already the title of this virtual seminar actually is very nice, AGQFT. That tells me that we're at the intersection between geometry and quantum field theory, and I feel very much at home there. Um, over the past years, I've been interested in particular in invariants that are shared by geometry and conformal field theory. And one of those invariants that I've studied particularly is the so-called elliptic genus. That has incarnation in both worlds, and in both worlds it counts things. For instance, on the quantum field theory side, it counts half and quarter BPS states. Uh, virtually, that means with a sign, so one has to be a bit careful when one interprets the results, but still it counts half and quarter BPS states, and that's how I explain the title that I gave to my talk. So today I want to start by introducing the elliptic genus, both in the complex geometry world and in superconformal field theory, very briefly, so we know what we're talking about. Then I will turn to orbifoldings, because honestly, when we want to construct examples with exact calculations, the best source we have to produce examples is to start from an easy manifold and then orbifold it, or to start from an easy superconformal field theory and then perform an orbifolding. So I have to briefly address that. And based in geometry, when orbifolding, you invariably need singularities, quotient singularities, and in the setting that I've been most interested in, um, the two-dimensional setting, these quotient singularities are always E-type singularities. So I'll briefly introduce the relevant notation terminology there before we turn to the actual topic of this talk, and those are the elliptic genera of those ADE-type singularities. So to appreciate what's going on here, you need to know that the elliptic genus a priori is uh, tailor-made to study compact complex manifolds. However, these singularities are of course modeled on non-compact spaces. So we have to have a few ideas how to adjust to the new setting here. And this part of the talk is actually entirely based on a recent PhD thesis that has been submitted under my supervision. It's Yuang Ho's thesis. And just two or three weeks ago, he submitted the very final version with all mistakes corrected and all that. So right now we're working on, I've started to work on um, preparing a preprint with the uh, results. Um, and then after introducing actually the elliptic genera or whatever uh, we can do in generalizing here in order to deal with ADE type singularities, in the final part of the talk, that's a brief extra treat, I will talk about quotienting ADE type singularities. And this really explains some relations between the different ADE type singularities that we've observed previously. This whole topic, the complex elliptic genus and some of its geometric and conformal field theoretic background has been at the center of attention of a joint long-term research project together with Anton Mina. So the work with her feeds into this talk as well. And I've listed here for you just the main um, sources, um, the main publications that I'm going to use in what follows. All right, so what is the elliptic genus? Um, in, uh, uh, in my view, I view the geometric elliptic genus, the so-called complex elliptic genus, as a refinement of the standard Euler characteristic, which here I only apply to compact complex manifolds at this point. And when I do that, I can calculate the Euler characteristic by this formula from the Hodge numbers of the manifold or rewriting things in a slightly more convenient way. I can observe that in here, in hiding, we actually have the holomorphic Euler characteristic of this holomorphic bundle. That's the case exterior power of the dual of the holomorphic tangent bundle for M. 
And then pushing this uh, shorthand notation a little bit further, I can write it like so, where I'm introducing a virtual bundle in here, pretending that chi is a kind of ring homomorphism from this ring uh, with uh, freely generated over the holomorphic vector bundles and with complex, with uh, integer coefficients, if you want. So this is just a shorthand notation, and I can make it even shorter by calling this virtual bundle lambda sub minus one t star. And that's the standard notation um, where even more generally one can work with lambda sub x e, where x is a formal variable. And this is the notation for the virtual bundle, which is really a formal power series in x coefficients made up of any vector bundle, in our case, holomorphic vector bundles. Here we're using the exterior powers of E. You cannot just as well use the metric powers, then you get a different type of virtual bundle called S sub X E. All right, so once we know of this shorthand notation, where in here I'm allowed to insert any integer instead of X, like minus one up here, maybe that encourages us to generalize by just introducing the bundle lambda sub X T star instead of this one here. That has been done. That's already a classical construction. You arrive at the Hirzebuch Kai Y genus if you do that. So um, instead of taking the holomorphic order characteristic of lambda minus one T star, now I'll use lambda Y T star with Y a formal variable. And here's a more pedestrian way of writing this. I'm just introducing a Y to the K in here instead of the minus one to the K that we had up there. So this is a refinement of the um, original Euler characteristic known as the hirzebruch chi y genus. And it gives us more information because every coefficient in front of a uh, power of y here will give us information about the manifold. Um, for what follows, it's useful to know that one can calculate all the ingredients here in terms of index theory. These holomorphic Euler characteristics are actually indices of elliptic differential operators. So one can use the hirzebruch riemann roch type formula to write out an integral expression for exactly this guy here, where we integrate over our manifold M and the integrand is given by a certain combination of characteristic classes, where here we need the Todd genus of M and the churn character of this virtual bundle. So we've already refined the Euler characteristic and now we're gonna push it much further by refining much further by introducing one extra formal variable and also by changing this bundle again, making it much more interesting, tensorizing that virtual bundle by this infinite tensor power of other virtual bundles. So if you've never seen this before, then never mind about the details. The most important thing here is that we are working with such a virtual bundle. We have introduced a new form of variable Q. And when you look at this thing here, inserting Q equal to zero will produce all trivial bundles here. So then we're back to almost what we started with up to some cosmetic changes because I've introduced a minus sign here, which will make our lives easier later. And also a prefactor, which at the moment has no particular um, justification. It's just there to make things nicer later on. So this is now the virtual bundle that we're going to work with. And its holomorphic Euler characteristic by definition is the complex elliptic genus of M. A priori, this is a formal power series in Q and Y and the inverse of Y, multiplied by inverse of Y here already. So um, here again, we have to use the fact that the churn character gives us a um, ring homomorphism. So this already is a power series, again, in terms of these virtual bundles, and then integrating out all the coefficients in front of powers of Q or Y or Y inverse will be integers, will be given by holomorphic Euler characteristics from some holo of some holomorphic vector bundles constructed from exterior powers and symmetric powers of T and T star. And now surprisingly, this formal expression that you produce like this actually has an analytic meaning. If you now reinterpret Q as e to the two pi i tau, and you reinterpret y as e to the two pi i z, where tau and z are complex numbers, tau from the upper half plane, what you get is in fact a holomorphic function in tau and z, which has very pretty properties. It is a ref 
refinement of the Euler characteristic, inserting z equal to zero here produces the Euler characteristic, as one can check. And um, it is an invariant of the manifold M. So it doesn't matter which complex structure you chose. We also never chose a metric or anything. This is a topological invariant of the manifold M. And I admit it's slightly dissatisfactory to introduce the complex elliptic genus like this because I gave you no reason to look at this weird um, virtual bundle here. Maybe it gets a little bit better if I tell you that this expression arises when you try to introduce a Dirac, an index of a Dirac operator on the loop space of M. First attempts will probably fail because things are very ill-defined, but if you try a U1 equivariant version, it gets a little better, and then you're almost immediately led to a natural regularization, which then gives the expression that I had on the previous transparency. So that's really the origin of that expression. Um, also, to do calculations with that expression, as I said earlier already, this index integral is very, very useful. And here I'm using some old strategies by Hirzebruch, who teaches us that using the splitting principle for your holomorphic tangent bundle, um, things become much more tractable. So the splitting principle here allows us to imagine or to, to, um, to pretend that the bundle T is just a direct sum of line bundles. So the total churn class will decompose like this. And the churn roots, these xj are called churn roots, they can be used to do calculations for characteristic classes. You can express all your characteristic classes in terms of these xj. For instance, the Todd genus is given by this expression. The churn character of the original lambda minus yt star that we had is given by this expression. And then you can guess what these guys correspond to, these then correspond to that infinite uh, tensor product that I had, namely the exterior powers up here and the symmetric powers down here. So that's a useful way of writing things also, because if you stare at this for a little while, and if you've ever seen Jacobi theta functions, then you agree that one can rewrite this much more neatly as a quotient of Jacobi theta functions. So now the prefactor here is justified because this step wouldn't be possible without the prefactor. And just to remind you all the time we were working with um, uh, stuff that can be viewed as a formal power series in Q and Y and Y to the minus one up to the prefactor that we introduced by hand. And writing it this way allows you to discuss some pretty properties of the complex elliptic genus. In particular, these Jacobi theta functions have very good modular properties. So having this expression in your hands, you can just check that there's good modular transformation properties, at least if the first churn class vanishes, because then you immediately check that this is actually a weak Jacobi form of weight zero and index D half with respect to the usual modular group. And in the calculation, at some point, you will need the fact that the sum of the xj is actually zero, and that's what c1 equal to zero means. So this is where it enters. All right, so that's the definition. I've defined a kind of counting function for complex compact manifolds. In particular, it's very pretty for um, those with vanishing first chunk class. So for Calabial manifolds, it's particularly pretty pretty, and it counts dimensions of certain cohomology spaces. What does it have as a counterpart in conformal field theory? Well, I'm going to be brief here and just share with you the notions that we need in order to say what we're doing. So given any super conformal field theory, um, that quantum field theory will have a space of states, I call it H. And I'm going to restrict to superconformal field theories with central charge three times d, where d is a non-negative integer. When I say superconformal field theory, I always mean two-dimensional conformal field theories and uh, unitary ones. And uh, in addition, I'm assuming a certain amount of supersymmetry. This is for the experts. Um, this is what I need as a requirement. So the space of states in particular carries the representation of some infinite dimensional super Lie algebra of which there are four particular operators that are most important for what I'm going to do. These are commuting linear operators on H that can be simultaneously diagonalized. All simultaneous eigenspaces 
boxes are finite dimensional. We're starting from a full fledged super conformal field theory. And there are also additional requirements on the eigenvalues, um, which will kind of show up in the applications later on. I'm not going to list them in detail here. The operators are called J0, L0 topological, and then there are twiddled partners of these two. These are the right moving partners of these so called left moving operators. And then there's, of course, much more on H. There's, in particular, an extended n equal to superconformal algebra acting. J0 and L0 are elements of that superconformal algebra. But uh, we won't really need the details of this for what follows. In fact, we don't even have to work with the full space of states. And that's actually crucial for what we'll do later. It's sufficient to reduce to the kernel of the operator L0 twiddle topological. And this space is known as the space of states of a topologically half twisted model. And any state in here is actually a quarter or a half BPS state just by definition. So whichever counting function I'm going to introduce on H0 twiddle is going to be a counting function for quarter and half BPS states. And this is exactly what we're going to look at. That's the title of my talk. The most natural counting function that might, one might want to write down if one is familiar with uh, these superconformal field theories is this one, because it looks very much like a partition function in superconformal field theory. So here we have two formal variables, q and q bar, where mostly it's legal to think of q bar as the complex conjugate of q. And I'm writing out a trace a priori over the um, topologically half-twisted space here. But so it happens that by the requirements on supersymmetry that I made up there, this counting function actually doesn't see any contribution, net contribution from eigenvectors of L0 twiddle top with non-zero eigenvalues. Because any such eigenvector will have a superpartner with the same eigenvalue, but with the opposite sign entering here. So you have dramatic cancellations from everybody who's not a, an element of this kernel. So that's um, why I made a, um, a bracket here, because you can take the trace over the full space of states and still get the same result as taking the trace over the topologically half-twisted model here, because just uh, by construction, you have cancellations all over the place. So the Q bar to the L0 twiddle top here is not really there. It just enters by multiplication by identity and reduction to the uh, kernel here. And then the same story happens for the left moving partner with the same reasoning with supersymmetry. Actually, Q to the L0 top also doesn't enter. enter. We reduce to the common kernel between these two operators. So really, the trace can be taken over H00 tilde, which is a much smaller space. And for my full-fledged superconformal field theories, by definition, it's always a finite dimensional space. And now we're just summing over finitely many integers, so we get an integer. And this is a beautiful invariant of conformal field theories. If you think of C as living in some moduli space, being dependent on some continuous moduli, the left-hand side can be argued to depend continuously on the moduli. On the right-hand side, we have an integer, so we have a locally constant function. This is actually an invariant for superconformal field theories known as the Witten index. And I would like to denote it by <coughs> chi h because it is closely related to the Euler characteristic with which we spoke about earlier. In fact, whenever your superconformal field theory is constructed as a nonlinear sigma model on some Calabria default M, the expectation is that the complex cohomology of that Calabria default is isomorphic to that space H00 tilde here, subspace of the topologically twisted model. And this is an isomorphism, which is correct in a bigraded way, where we have a bigradation bi over here by the Hodge structure. And on the right-hand side, J0 and J0 twiddle give you a bigradation. These happen to have just integral eigenvalues due to the assumptions that I made up here and didn't really explain. So if that is true, then it immediately follows that the Euler characteristic of M must agree with the Witten index of my theory. 
And uh, we could also introduce an analog of the chi y genus by replacing the minus one to the j zero here by a y to the j zero, just as we did in the geometric setting. And here we're taking now the trace over this space, which officially is uh, expected to be identified with the cohomology of M. Oh, excuse me, Katrin? Yeah. Um, these are all two dimensional superconformal field yes. theories, right? Yes. Um, so when you call this the topologically half-twisted model, are you saying there's a topological field theory corresponding to this somehow? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, the topological field theory would live on this guy because this is ah, that's the topological field yes, theory. This is fully twisted and it's just finite dimension also. So that's finite dimension. I see. Half-twisted somehow. It, it it's don't... just half-twisted because I've only taken the kernel of this operator. And if I also take the kernel of that operator, then I'm here. And if you've ever seen these PRST cohomologies. Mm -hmm. um, in some sense here, I'm looking at the harmonic representatives of cohomology classes okay. by looking at the kernel of this particular operator. I see. So H00 will be the actual state space of the topological exactly. field theory. Okay, thank you. Exactly. exactly. But I do want to work with this generally infinite dimensional space because, uh, well, we understand all that characteristic uh, reasonably well, and I want to understand the, the um, elliptic genus. So given that it, this identification worked so well on the level of the um, Euler characteristic, if this expectation here holds, shouldn't we expect to be able to construct um, uh, the elliptic genus that we saw earlier also in the CFT setting? And the answer is yes, one can do that. One can do that independently of the expectation that I had up there. And the step now is very easy. I replace this finite dimensional space and the trace for the chi y genus here by H0 tilde, the topologically half twisted model. And I take almost exactly the same operator that we had up there up to those changes that are made by hand. Also, when I introduce the complex elliptic genus, I'm introducing another minus sign here to get back the minus one to the j zero. And I'm introducing a shift here. Previously, this was a shift by minus d divided by two, and now it's minus c divided by six. We'll see the central charge up there. And uh, doing this, again, I have a choice whether I want to work on the topologically half twisted uh, space or on the full space of states, because again, by these supersymmetry considerations, it doesn't matter. Q bar here doesn't enter either way, because you have all these cancellations. Um, so I, for the following, I will work on H0 twiddle because that's the simpler setting and later on it will come useful. Uh, whether or not you've used this motivation through the expectation here, you can always make this definition and the result will be a very nice invariant of the superconformal field theory. It will always be again, a formal power series in Q and Y and Y to the minus one up to a prefactor here. The coefficients will be integers and what you're really counting is counting states in certain common eigenspaces of these operators that I introduced up there. And this will also always give you a weak Jacobi form of weight zero and um, index D divided or C divided by six. So it stands a chance to meet this requirement here. And indeed that's the expectation in general and the expectation certainly holds true for complex tori, for almost trivial reasons because everything is zero there. And for K3 surfaces, so that's also something where one would have to discuss how to define conformal field theories associated to K3. So the main part of the work to make this statement correct here is to give a proper definition, but we can do that. And with the proper definition, this statement is almost a tautology. But uh, either way, it's a correct statement and we have at least some playground where this identification works. Uh, 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 yeah. Is this, so this expectation you write down, is this something for which there is a physics proof? Nah, I'm not sure what a physics proof is. So there's good reason, there's, there's good reason for this. Let's put it that way. By uh, taking large volume limits and arguing that you have invariance on both sides. So there's a good reason to, to mm. expect this in all cases where we know how to perform large volume limits and non linear signal models. I I see, but, but it's not something for which one even has a heuristic proof of some sort. No. 
Well, if you, well, okay, I mean, um, on the level of complex tori, definitely one can simply check this. So there, uh -huh. everything that's written here is con concretely true. And then all the orbifolds are fine as well. And then all the deformations of orbifolds are fine as well. So you get pretty far with just um, making your way from tori through orbifoldings, et cetera. So I'm not, I'm, I, I wouldn't claim that this is uh, in question any time, but I also wouldn't claim that there is a proper proof for it. Great. But for example, I guess I'm just naively thinking if one makes, if you take this sigma model and uh, assume that all the path integrals that people usually use make sense, there still isn't one touch. Well, then, 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 then you can prove this. Yes. Then that, that's what I was asking. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Then, then you can prove this. Yes. Right. yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So um, just yeah, as I say, I mean, I want, don't want to claim that there's a mathematical proof, but it's something that I use freely for, my, at least for my inspiration, and I have no doubt that it's correct. Okay, great. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. But uh, it can make us over, um, over ambitious because it's worked so well here identifying some subspace of our space of states mm -hmm. with cohomology. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't we also then identify the topologically half-twisted model with some cohomological data that underlie mm -hmm. the um, geometric elliptic genus? Right. And the geometric elliptic genus, remember, that was a holomorphic Euler characteristic of this virtual bundle, EQ minus right. one here. Mm -hmm. And then it would be natural to expect that these two agree, but right. that could not be more wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a pity because it's somehow at the basis of many ideas in the literature. It's of course not phrased like this, but uh, there are few minor or major mistakes in the literature that go back to this expectation because it's so natural. Um, but the problem is, well, the right-hand side actually very, very severely depends on the details of the superconformal field theory that you have chosen. Although the graded Euler characteristic of this guy is an invariant of your moduli space, the mm -hmm. space itself changes dramatically as you walk about moduli space. Mm -hmm. And in general, for those examples where we can make calculations, this space is much larger than that one. So then, okay, but you could say, well, let's look at the generic subspace here. Just look at the lower bound of how many states there should be at every um, common eigenvalue here. That generic space can be defined and makes a lot of sense and is very, very important, but that space is smaller than this one. So there's a slight problem here, and this is not the topic of this talk, but I do want to mention it because I think it's an important point to make at this stage. One can define a generic space of states, and by this I mean something like a lower bound to the topologically half-twisted model in the K3 setting. It means that uh, we have a representation of our extended superconformal algebra and the J0 twiddle, which is still left acting on here. And for any K3 theory, this representation injects into the topologically half-twisted state space. So that is a sh space shared by all K3 theories. However, this space cannot be described as the cohomology of what we thought. It can be described geometrically as the cohomology of the chiral ramp complex of K3 surfaces. I'm not going to define it just for the experts. A nice mathematical gadget introduced by Malikov, Schechtmann, and Weintraub. And this one is smaller than this one in general. And that might be important in the future. So again, this is slightly a detour, but I did want to mention this independently of Min Zhong's question. I wanted to mention this because I'm very, very interested in studying this generic space of states. I think it's going to be important to understand K3 theories fully at some point. And there is a little bit of progress. There's also some positive things to say from this construction. One can deduce that something that string theorists said it should be true is actually true, definitely. Um, namely the generic superconformal algebra of K3 theories is not extended beyond n equal four. And um, also we have for first results on studying this generic space of states in particular comparing it to a slightly larger space which is generic to Z2 orbifold conformal field theories on K3. And that's precisely where the project with Anne Tarmina feeds in. And there's some very pretty recent progress um, in terms of deformation theory of K3 theories by Christoph Keller and Ida Sade that I would like to mention here. So that's definitely going to be important when we 
try and understand better what this generic space is and how it relates to the topologically half-twisted models of less generic A3 theories. But anyway, that's a detour. Today, I wanted to talk about something else. I wanted to talk about things that we can concretely calculate. And um, yeah, I mentioned in the introduction already, when it comes to constructing examples, the best technique that we have is orbifolding. So what's this orbifolding about? On the geometric side, the setting that I want to use here is a Calabiao default M and a group gamma, a finite subgroup of SU2 acting on M through holomorphic maps and such that the holomorphic volume form of M is preserved. And these conditions ensure that the quotient, although it will have singularities, can be resolved. You can resolve those singularities minimally, and that's what the twiddle here denotes. And the resolution then will be a Calabiao default again. I call it the gamma orbifold of M. So that's a pretty construction to make new, more complicated Calabiao defaults out of simpler ones. And the construction has a counterpart in conformal field theory. And actually, I'm telling the story the wrong way around. There's been a, an orbifolding procedure in conformal field theory even before one had this, um, I mean, this, this, this construction, at least in string theory. I think the first version of orbifold conformal field theories can be found in the construction of the monster CFT, where Lepofsky and Murman used orbifolding in order to construct this theory without any geometric interpretation. And then not much later in a seminal paper by Dixon, Harvey, Waffa, and Witten, it was noticed that there's actually a lot of geometry hidden there and one can use this construction to um, make new conformal field theories out of old ones by thinking of this orbifold construction in geometric terms. So there's a whole orbifolding construction on the level of conformal field theory, which is analogous to what we do here. And again, the expectation is that things commute. So the sigma model associated to an orbifold should be the orbifold of the sigma model of the original manifold. And this definitely holds true in the, two true in the two dimensional setting where you would start with a complex two torus and the global action of a subgroup of SU2 as above. The quotient will have singularities, but you can blow them up, resolve them minimally and the outcome will be a K3 surface. And if you now associate conformal field theories to everything, then the um, conformal field theory associated to the orbifold will indeed be the conformal field theoretic orbifold of the theory associated to M. And again, there's a bit of small print here. The main work goes into defining things properly and to defining what it means to associate a particular theory to a particular K3 surface. And uh, that, that, that's the difficulty here. And once one has done that, the result follows. And originally we did that starting from a torus, but the techniques immediately generalize to the setting where you start from a K3 surface and obtain another K3 surface. So here again, we have a pretty safe playground to play with. So uh, why is this interesting now? I mean, we already know what the um, elliptic genus of K3 surfaces are and of K3 theories. We know explicitly what it is and there's only one because it's an invariant of these surfaces. But I would now like to an analyze this in more detail because we have this orbifold construction. Shouldn't it be possible to express the K3 elliptic genus in terms of the contributions that come from the manifold M? and contributions from each singularity separately. So we should take a look at the singularities that can occur here. And we're in a pretty safe setting. We're working on surfaces with quotient singularities by groups of this sort. And then the uh, fact is that the resulting singularities are so-called simple singularities and they enjoy an ADE classification. And although most of you probably know this, I want to keep a short overview of of this, so also we have the notations uh, in the proper form. So the singularities that can occur here are these quotient singularities, and they are classified simply because the finite subgroups of SU2 are classified. And we classify them in an ADE type pattern because all these groups can be viewed as lifts of finite subgroups of SO3 to SU2, and the finite subgroups of SO3 that exist are the cyclic groups the dihedral groups and the symmetry groups of the platonic solids 
let's call them tetrahedral, octahedral, and icosahedral. So these are the only groups that can occur, and we label them by AD and E, respectively. And when we resolve the singularity here, we can do that by repeated blow-up. Depends on the type of group, how many blow-ups we need. But in any case, every blow-up produces one or two rational curves, CP1s. And then at the end of the day, we'll get a bouquet, some chain of CP1s of minus two curves, and they are arranged according to the diagrams that you see here. And this is actually the dual resolution graph, so-called dual resolution graph, where each node symbolizes a CP1, an irreducible component of your exceptional divisor in the blow up. And any two of these irreducible components will intersect. If they intersect, they will intersect transversely. And if such an intersection occurs, I will connect the two corresponding nodes by an edge. And there you go with these diagrams. And these are the well-known ADE type Dinkin diagrams that uh, are familiar from Lie, Lie algebras. So that's a nice way of uh, you know, uh, picturing the exceptional divisor and the blow up here. And if you wish to express these um, singular varieties over here and as hypersurfaces in C3, that's also possible. Uh, these polynomials will do, and these are actually precisely the representatives of each of the classes of uh, simple singularities up to stable equivalents that Arnold has classified, and where the ADE pattern is also um, traditionally used to describe them. So that's the setting in which I want to work now, and I want to take a look at these singularities separately. I want to ask whether we can we can define elliptic genera for any of these ADE type singularities. Not all of them can occur on K3 surfaces, but the only ones that we are interested on K3 surfaces are of this type. And it's a natural question now to ask whether for these ADE type singularities, we can introduce elliptic genera. And uh, just to, to simplify notation, up from now on, I will denote by AD and E, either the respective subgroup of SU2 or the resolved singularity. Now, the question seems taunting because I've introduced the complex elliptic genus as an uh, invariant for compact complex manifolds. And this one is not compact at all. Um, also for the uh, conformal field theoretic setting, I cannot associate a super conformal field theory with all the requirements that I had to this space. But what I can do, and that's commonly known, is uh, I can associate a topologically half-twisted model to this space, and that's not very difficult. And then we will see whether we can then calculate a conformal field theoretic elliptic genus from that. So this is why I insisted on introducing a topologically half-twisted model, because in this setting, I don't want to go beyond that. I don't want to construct an underlying superconformal field theory. So what's this model for C2? It's not so hard to describe it. It's again built on an infinite, an infinite dimensional complex vector space. And you can view this vector space as being cooked up from polynomial space, the vector space of polynomials, but with infinitely many variables. They're traditionally denoted A and K and B and K. And for B here, it's good to view this as some quantized version of the coordinate functions on C2 the underlying C2 here. So that's why the upper index K can run from one or to two. So it only takes two values in this two-dimensional setting. The lower index gives you the level of excitement of the state that you might want to be constructing. Zero is the lowest level here. M can take any non-negative integer value and B0K is quite literally um, can be quite literally identified with the coordinate uh, zk of C2, and then you have higher excited levels. And then on the other hand, you have uh, another tower of such um, um, form of variables here, if you want, um, that are dual to the bkm. And that, if you do the algebra, means that the index of an can only be a positive integer. So that's somewhat a technical detail, but it's quite crucial later on. 
But uh, be that as it may, this is a standard construction of the bosonic part of the topologically half twisted model constructed on C2. And now everybody has a superpartner. BMK has phi MK as its superpartner. So again, M here is any non negative integer. And um, ANK has the psi NK as superpartners. And because these are fermionic, we must take wedge products here rather than tensor products. So that's a structured infinite dimensional space that I've constructed for you. And it carries a standard action of an extended superconformal algebra. You can view it as a Fox space, constructed as a Fox space representation from some Heisenberg um, algebra and its um, um, super partners here. So um, that is just technical and we won't need the details. It's not, not really complicated, but uh, all we will need is the action of these three operators that I singled out earlier already. So, uh, do, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, this is the, already the half twisted space, right? This That's thing. already the half twisted space. Right. And I don't want to construct a super conformal field theory to it right. because I have difficulties uh, because this is a non-compact space. Uh, C2 is a non-compact space, mm -hmm. so I couldn't bring it into the form that I need for a definition of a full-fledged mm -hmm. conformal field theory, where all these common eigenspaces were finite dimensional. And we will see yeah. that it's, this is not the case here, actually. Even with the half-twisted model, it isn't. Ah, so say again, which things are not finite dimensional? Uh, Give me, give me a few seconds, then I'll get there. So we will see non-finite non dimensional stuff, which had to be finite dimensional in the previous setting. Uh, and that's where the non-compactness is appearing. That's yes. where the non-compactness is visible. And that's why our first attempt to construct a elliptic genus here must fail. If I just naively write down the expression that I would have written down for a proper superconformal field theories, this expression is ill-defined. The coefficients are infinite in this expression. They are infinite, and we'll see why in a second. Okay. Because L0 top has a very easy action here. Um, mm -hmm. It just measures the index of mm -hmm. A, B, phi, and psi. J0 twiddle is trivial altogether, and J0 is trivial on the bosonic guys, and it measures fermionic charge, if you want. Mm -hmm. So now we would try and write down this trace. So we would have to consider common eigenspaces of these three operators, but we are in trouble because we have a B0K here. M is allowed to be zero. B0K doesn't change the eigenvalue of any of our operators. And you can take any polynomial in B0K and uh, get yet another eigenspace. Uh, eigenvector from a given eigenvector at any given eigenvalue. See by acting with the polynomials in B0K that every eigenspace must be infinite dimensional. Okay, okay thank you. That expression is ill-defined, but it's ill-defined so dramatically that one can get an idea that is commonly used in this area um, from just looking at why this is ill-defined. You could just break up those infinite dimensional spaces into smaller spaces by looking at the action of yet another operator and looking at its eigenspaces. Or better even, we'll make it equivariant. That's a trick that often works and it also worked previously for the um, loop space index actually. That was an equivariant thing as well. So here the action that we use is just the usual multiplication by complex numbers in C2. So I want non-zero complex numbers so to have a group action and that's what we'll use. And since B actually um, gives you the quantization if you want of the, um, the complex variables here, you better multiply BMK by Xi when you act with Xi. And Phi is a super partner so it should be dealt with the same way and by doing the algebra or remembering that I said that this is dual to that one. It's not very difficult to deduce that you must multiply with the inverse of Xi here and there. And now inserting this twisting by this action, you will get a well-defined quantity as long as you stay away from those um, values of Xi where Xi acts trivially. So Xi equal to one is of course forbidden, but all the other values of Xi are fine. Sorry, so this, this C star action is commutes with the superconformal algebra action? Yes, it commutes with everything. It will commute with our groups <laughs> gamma here. So it's... Uh, oh, I see. Okay, I see. <laughs> yeah. And it fixes our problem quite explicitly so. So if you've ever done such calculations, this will be easy for you. And for the others, it's probably going to be a little bit too fast. But I'm now going to calculate this expression. Um, 
and I'm going to call it the C star equivariant elliptic genus for this space here, where zeta shows up here, psi is e to the two pi i zeta. So maybe we start down here, this one minus q to the n minus one psi square takes care of bmk square because k can take two values. Uh, m is equal to n minus one, that's the lower index, which starts with zero, so that's compatible. And the action of psi is just multiplication by psi. And it's below the, um, I mean, it's, uh, uh, we have to divide by this. So really we have to take a geometric series here. So expanding this, you will see that you get actually the counting of states in this polynomial algebra that we had earlier. And this part here really takes care of all the BMK. Analogously here for the ANK with the only difference that here N starts with one, as I said, and the psi action is just given by the inverse of what we had for the Bs. And up here we have the fermionic contributions. So this needs a little bit of practice, but if you've once played with these kinds of Fox spaces a little bit, then this step from here to here is actually very, very easy. And uh, then we notice that this expression looks familiar because again, Again, we have the quotient of two theta functions here, or squares of theta functions. Um, and indeed, uh, theta one vanishes at zeta equal to zero, so zeta equal to zero is definitely forbidden. And I said that from the start, psi mustn't be one because we already noticed that things are ill-defined there. But other than that, we have a well-defined equivariant index here, uh, an equivariant um, uh, elliptic genus here. And uh, this has also good modular properties has good modular properties. So it lends itself almost immediately to applying orbifolding techniques. So we can just now formally apply the usual orbifolding techniques and for instance, write out the um, C star equivariant elliptic genus for AK type singularities. And for the experts, this is exactly what you expect, like the prefactor where you divide by the order of the group. Here you have the cyclic group of order K plus one attached to this, so this is what you expect. For n equal to zero, letting m run from zero to k, what you see here is just making things invariant under the zk plus one action. And uh, n actually is the index which labels the twisted sectors if you ever worked in this area. So this is now just mechanical from here to there is not even particularly difficult. And here we go with an expression for an elliptic genus on an AK type singularity. This formula was already given by Harvey Lee and Multi in a very beautiful paper in 2015, where they arrive at the formula from a slightly different perspective. They're starting from gauged linear sigma models, but things translate easy, easily into what we do here. Um, and they also had other um, applications in mind. So they wanted to look at more complicated spaces. Um, what they didn't write out then are the analogous formulas for the other singularities, dk and ek, but you can now imagine that that works in a similar fashion. The building blocks will always look like these, but they're then added in with different weights maybe. The uh, abelian subgroups of these groups are always cyclic groups, so things are closely related, just the formulas get a little more ugly. But um, since all the building blocks are like this, it's not so surprising that we can more conveniently write um, the expressions that we get as just linear combinations of the A-type singularities. So we have the expressions, we have them all here. And that's quite a bit of calculation that you need to do, but now it's kind of mechanical. All right, so we have equivariant elliptic genera, C star equivariant elliptic genera for ADE-type singularities. We derived this from a quantum field theory point of view and geometry got a little bit lost in the background, but we're actually in good shape because the trick that we used was to apply a C star equivariant version. And there's of course a vast mathematical in literature about equivariant index theory. So we should, you should use that to give a geometric counterpart. And we can go back to the really traditional work, classical work by Atiyah Bott and Atiyah Singer, who write out an equivariant index theorem for compact complex d-dimensional manifolds if there is a compact topological group acting. And the recipe is here. At the end, you arrive at a twisted um, complex elliptic genus, twisted by any group element G. And the formula looks very similar to the one that we saw earlier for the complex elliptic genus 
well, it better should because if G is the identity, then we need to get back to the uh, previous version where we have this quotient of theta functions. And in general, the recipe is this, take your group element, calculate the fixed point locus, decompose it into its connected components. Then on each of these connected components, if you restrict the holomorphic tangent bundle, one can argue that it splits into eigenbundles with respect to the action of G. The respective eigenvalue here is lambda, and I'll write it as e to the 2 pi i z zeta lambda. And then the last ingredient that I need are the churn roots of each of these summons called xj lambda here. And then the result for the twisted elliptic genus is the sum over the connected components of the fixed point locus here. And then in each case, an integral over the respective component and an expression, which is almost the same as the one that we had previously in the non-equivariant case. So that's very pretty, but on the other hand, I'm not allowed to use it because I wanted to work on a non-compact space. And I wanted to work with the group C star, which is also not particularly compact. But uh, now we're actually in good luck because as long as you choose your group element appropriately, it's still okay to apply this index theorem, at least for the non-compact manifolds, because down here, everything is well-defined as, as, as long as the fixed point locus is actually compact. So in particular, in the setting that we're using, as long as we don't use the identity here to twist with, we will be fine. And if you look in the proof of the equivariant index theorem, there's also some cancellation going on, and that goes through even in the non-compact case. So probably get away with the non-compact manifold. And with C star, well, if you want to be very careful, then you could start with a U1 equivariant elliptic genus. So instead of using e to the 2 pi i zeta here with arbitrary complex zeta, you could first restrict to real number zeta. We could have done that in the quantum field theory setting as well. And then after the fact, notice that we can extend to arbitrary complex values of zeta. And that's the safe way to deal with this here. So instead of constructing a C star equivariant complex elliptic genus, I would work with a U1 equivariant elliptic genus for starters. And then things actually do work. For instance, for the A1 type singularity, so A1, remember, is supposed to mean the blow up of the quotient here. I'm using this C star action described above. So it's just multiplying by um, elements of C star on C2. That action, as we discovered previously, commutes with Z2. It descends to the quotient here. Actually, the action maps complex lines through zero to complex lines through zero. And it stays non-trivial as long as psi is not plus one or minus one on the quotient. And if it maps complex lines through zero to complex to themselves as it does, it's actually, it immediately follows that the exceptional divisor of the blow up here is completely invariant under this action. Again, the action doesn't only map a complex line through zero to another complex line through zero, it maps that complex line to itself because psi is one of the complex parameters that we have there. So the fixed point locus in this case is the um, exceptional divisor, it's a CP1. And now it's not so difficult to split the holomorphic tangent bundle along that CP1. You have the tangent bundle of CP1 itself, which corresponds to the eigenvalue plus one and the eigenvalue on the complement, you have to calculate it comes out as psi squared. And now we just use the formula that I had on the previous transparency. Luckily, we have to integrate over CP1. That's a compact space. X1 and X2 are, again, the churn roots of M. And because C1 is, again, 0 here, X2 is actually minus X1. So we have an expression here, which just rises from what I had on the previous transparency, where here I'm in inducing, introducing zeta zeta lambda equal to zero, corresponding to the eigenvalue one in the exponent here. And here I'm introducing zeta lambda equal to psi squared. So that's two zeta in the exponent. And other than that, I'm just copying what I had on the previous transparency. And now I must perform this integral. But again, that's possible on the one hand, because minus x2 is plus x1. And on the other hand, because I'm integrating over this one dimensional space, so I, if I didn't have the theta functions back here, I would know immediately what the result is, uh, because this is just by definition the Euler characteristic of CP1, two. 
So what I must do now is expand this quotient here as a formal power series in X1 and collect all the constant terms in X1. But that's possible. And then uh, by a L'Hopital rule, you won't be surprised that you get three summons over here. So one can perform that calculation that um, integration can be done explicitly and we get an expression. That's the geometric version of the ADE type elliptic genus, which uh, the um, equivariant elliptic genus. And again, if you want to play safe, then you could work on U1 first. So only allow real values for zeta, produce this expression here and observe that it's completely legal to insert complex values of zeta. Of course, there are poles because for instance, zeta equal to zero is illegal, but it should be because then we're back to integrating over a non-compact space and we're actually integrating stuff which doesn't converge there. So all is consistent and you can imagine that we can pull off the same game for all the other singularities. The formula is not very pretty and it gets more ugly for the other singularities, but we have closed formulas for each case. But it's a bit disappointing because this is so much more complicated than the expression that we got from the conformal field, from the um, quantum field theory side. But now, luckily, with some massive theta function gymnastics, you will observe that both expressions actually agree, and they do agree for all ADE type singularities. So the C star equivariant elliptic genus of an ADE type singularity calculated geometrically agrees with the quantum field theory or default elliptic genus of C2 taken by the relevant group. So again, we have a setting where these uh, notions fit very well together. And we just prove this by calculating all the separate um, instances and then equating them by uh, theta function um, gymnastics. All right, so this I find now satisfactory, unless I think of the motivation that I originally had, I said, let's look at these ADE type singularities and consider um, elliptic genera and try to disentangle the K3 elliptic genus into contributions that come from an underlying manifold before orbifolding and then adding contributions from the singularities separately. And uh, of course we're in trouble here because this only works equivariantly. I'm not allowed to insert zeta equal to zero. We've convinced ourselves of the fact that uh, that is ill-defined at zeta equal to zero. So I can't just attach it to some other stuff from K3 geometry. And um, also I can't just extend the C star action to the whole K3 surface. It will be uh, ill-defined. And also for the underlying manifold M, may it be a torus or a K3 surface, we will never have a C star action like this. So we won't get away with doing it equivariantly there. Instead, we have to regularize our elliptic genus, our C star equivariant elliptic genus, so that it will be legal to send this parameter to zero after regularization. And here again, the inspiration comes from the seminal paper that I mentioned earlier by Dixon, Harvey, Waffa, and Witten, which introduced the orbifolding techniques to the string theory world. And um, here I'm using a special setting, which is made for the applications that I have later. And I'm reading from their paper the following. Starting from a Calabi-Yau fold as before, the orbifolding by a finite subgroup F SUD as before should act holomorphically. It should preserve the holomorphic volume form. Then in this paper, there is a very beautiful orbifold Euler characteristic formula. It's not quite this one, but we are kind of forced to reshuffle the terms on the right hand side to actually arrive at a formula like this, where we're considering the set of singularities in the quotient. And now um, sorting things on the right hand side here so that there is a contribution from the underlying manifold M and there is a contribution from each singularity separately. I'm calling this the regularized Euler characteristic of the singularity. So in particular, if you want to insert M equal to C2 and one of our ADE type groups here, then over here, chi of C2 is just one. And uh, over here, the Euler characteristics of these blown up spaces can be calculated, they're integers. So uh, the sum here then collapses to just one summand because there's only one singular point. And that tells you how to define the regularized Euler characteristic of an ADE type singularity. It's this guy corrected for by the contribution coming from the underlying manifold. 
It's a rational number, it's not integer anymore, but still it's a rational number. We use this as an inspiration to say what a regularized version of our equivariant of the genus should be. And it goes like this. We're taking a finite subgroup of SU2, and I want to define a regularized version of our equivariant elliptic genus. And I do it by using the ordinary elliptic genus, the C star equivariant elliptic genus of that singularity, and correcting by subtracting one over the order of the group G times the contribution that comes from the underlying manifold C2, which we also calculated by hand on the previous transparency. Now, this expression has really nice properties. In particular, it allows to send zeta to zero without punishment. We get a well-defined quantity. And when we insert z equal to zero here, actually, the expression reduces to the regularized Euler characteristic here, and that's what it should. And finally, if we now insert into our orbifold formula for any Calabria two-fold m, so this is now um, should be compact now, and gamma, a finite group that acts holomorphically on M, leaving the holomorphic volume form invariant, then we get exactly the same type of formula that we read from Dixon, Harvey, Ruff, and Witten, only that now we've refined the Euler characteristics to elliptic genera. And in particular, here we have a contribution from the underlying manifold, and here we have separate contributions from each of the elliptic, uh, from each of the singularities where it becomes legal to send the parameter zeta to zero. I should say there are other versions of regularized elliptic genera of ADE type singularities on the market, in particular one version by Iguchi and Taramina, and another one by Cheng and Harrison. They are different from ours, that much we already know, because the properties of their functions are completely different from the properties of our functions but um, there's still a little bit of homework to do to say exactly how the different uh, definitions relate to one, one another. But ours is definitely different from theirs. So that is uh, what we were aiming for. And now if you allow me maybe three more minutes, I'm going to give you a special treat by explaining the relations that we saw um, among the elliptic genera of the ADE type singularities earlier. I swept that a little bit under the carpet, I said I'm using this as a notational simplification that, for instance, the D-type elliptic genus is expressed in terms of these A-type elliptic gen genera. But now that we know that everything has a geometric interpretation, maybe we should go and search for a geometric interpretation of this precise formula. And yes, there is one. There is one that goes back to beautiful work by Slodovy in the 80s, who, among other things, teaches us that we can do this um, well, dividing by gamma and resolving in several steps. For instance, each of our groups gamma has a subgroup Z2, just plus minus identity. And uh, when we divide by that, we can first resolve the action of the residual group here can be extended to the exceptional divisor here. And then the quotient again has singularities, blowing them up, you get the full thing. So here, we want to start with this easy quotient, the A1 singularity, which as an exceptional divisor just has CP1. So that's the red dot that you see here. On it, you have a residual group action by the quotient here, which happens to have three singular points. Each looks like the fixed point of some cyclic group acting. So the fact that you then have three legs growing here is almost immediately obvious. You might expect now to see A1, A1, and a k minus two, but that's not what it is. What you actually have is a half a three, a half a three, and a half a two k minus three, because you shouldn't forget that actually we're already working in a quotient. So to express everything in the usual terminology, you still have to take a two to one cover and then go back downwards again. So that's what the factor one half here means. So I thinking of, I'm thinking of this as an a three type diagram folded in the middle and then glued head on to the red dot here. But that's then exactly the formula that we have up here, half an a2k minus three and twice the half a3. We're now kind counting the middle dot three times with a prefactor of one half. So we have overcounted and have to make good for that. And the same strategy works for all the other cases. E6 has a half 
a3 here and a half a5 here and another half a5 here so that's what, that's what you see in formula precisely again we have to make up for overcounting e7 we keep the half a3 we keep one of the half a5s and the long leg then is a half a7 make up for overcounting and for e8 now it starts getting boring the a7 is replaced by an a9 with the prefactor one half so that's our geometric interpretation of the formula that we got just by doing the algebra. Okay, I'm sorry I went over time a little bit, and that's it. I thank you for your patience and for your attention. Oh, thank you. Uh, maybe I could ask a question or two. Um, if um, so, in the geometric uh, elliptic genus, you're always using this uh, Hertzberg style uh, bundle, right? Yes. Uh, uh, but you said somewhere along the way that sometimes this doesn't agree with the conformal field theoretic elliptic genus. Mm. You said there are examples where they don't agree. No, I didn't. No, say that. that's not what you said. <laughs> sorry, maybe I said it, but I didn't mean it. I'm sorry. Ah, maybe I mis misunderstood you. It's just not obvious that it must agree. That's uh -huh. that's what I said. And oh, what does it. not agree is the underlying space. So that's actually something I do want to emphasize where is it here so right, that right. logically half twisted space does not agree with the cohomology of that bundle although right. it, it looks natural to make this identification because the graded Euler characteristic mm -hmm. of this guy agrees with the graded Euler characteristic oh, of this I see. Uh -huh. but those of course are indices so we're counting with signs there are cancellations going on so you I cannot see. Work yeah. backwards, and uh, yeah. you cannot use that. The fact that the other characteristics agree, you cannot right. use it as a proof. Right. These two agree. In fact, they don't. <laughs> but yeah, you also said I think that this half-twisted uh, uh, space agrees with the cohomology of the Cairo drum complex. That's always true. So for K three, I ca we can show that. And ah, we use we use uh, Bailin Song's results, who I think has generalized his results by now to hyperkähler manifolds. Mm -hmm. So this probably holds in greater generality. But it, he does a fairly explicit calculation of the cohomology of the Kyrodram complex. And using that, one can arrive at this result. Oh, I so I, I, I would expect it to hold much more generally, but we just don't, there's no proof so far. Whatsoever. I see. OK, I, 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 I see. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I was a bit confused about the statement along the way. Sorry. Um, no, that's great. Um, are there other, qu other questions? Sure, you have a question? Hi, thank you. Thank you, Minyo. Uh, I, I really, uh, I mean, it just, I just, because I want to understand it better, it's a really naive question. Uh, in general, a uh, BPS state essentially corresponds to where the, the BPS bound is saturated, that the mass of the state is equal to the absolute value of the central charge or uh, Central charges, depending on how big um, uh, your SUSI algebra is or how much uh, supersymmetry do you have. And then uh, corresponding to that, there's a short or ultra short representation of your uh, SUSI algebra. And um, the dimension of that uh, representation is basically these uh, BPS numbers. Um, well, one, if uh, well, if my, so I learned this from Wes and Bagger, and if my analogy works here, what is uh, uh, the mass of uh, these uh, BPS states or the central charges actually? Do they, I mean, in some geometric theories, they turn out to be um, integrals of uh, forms over cycles in uh, geometric situations, let's say. So I cannot answer your question because I would have to do the translation back because we're always working in the setting, but definitely this is the same definition of BPS states that are, you are used to because the BPS bound here is just saying, in this setting is just saying that L0, uh, L0 here, this one, L0 is a positive definite operator. And when we work and uh, that actually there's a bound given by the fact that this one is always, um, greater or equal to zero. And we work at the bound where this is equal to zero. Yeah, so that's great. So, imposing the BPS bound as you're used to it. Very good. So in your case, uh, is how do you, is there a necessary and sufficient conditions when you can say the bound is achieved? Or when it is a BPS? Well, 
Yes, it's, it's again, it's the same thing that you said. So um, the corresponding irreducible representations actually break up into smaller ones. That's yeah. exactly what happens here. Okay. Okay. And when I'm talking about this uh, generic space of states and how it sits in the non-generic space, uh, topologically half-twisted uh, space of states, when you um, deform by making use of the moduli, what you actually see happening is depending on which way you go, if the space becomes smaller, what actually happens is that um, two of these shorter um, representations actually mm -hmm. come together and form a long one and move off the BPS bound. So that's exactly, I think, the situation that you're used to. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, yeah, that's uh, okay. So, so indeed, if I, if I phrase everything out in terms of irreducible representations of the superconformal algebra, where in the K3 setting, I would use an n equal four algebra here, then you uh -huh. can formulate everything in terms of long and short representations, just as you said. Okay, great. So that's the... Uh, well, we call these states massless, but I'm not sure whether that's the same mass as the one that you're talking. So I'm a little bit shaky on the words there because I always work in this, uh, this, this context, like here. Yeah, the representations for these, uh, where these short representations do correspond to massless representations, although the state itself has some mass. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. And beware, I mean, here I'm saying quarter and half BPS states because I'm imposing, it's also the question that uh, Minjong was asking, I'm imposing this condition in general only on the right movers. So I see. The full BPS states would be this space here and in the context of my superconformal field theories, that's then um, the Cairo ring, if you want, that's also interesting but it's much easier to grasp and uh, elliptic right. so This is actually very nice. I, 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 so, um, so on the left-hand side, you have a grading given by degree and uh, the diff, I mean, there's a real difference. So the one corresponds to bosons and the other corresponds to fermions and your uh, supercharges or super operators basically exchange uh, bosons and fermions. Yes. Um, but how do you see the supercharge acting on cohomology? I mean, the grading is obvious. Well, on the left-hand side, I'm just using um, uh, I, I'm, I'm just using the usual Dolbo cohomology. Mm -hmm. So you could use the Dolbo operators to um, ah, tell okay. you. About yeah, yeah, no, that's a, okay. That's a very. And, and that's what I. And that's uh, something that's often missed in, um, in the explanations, although it's in there somehow in the background, you know, for cohomology, we can always choose representatives that are harmonic. So I would mm -hmm. choose representatives that vanish under the corresponding Laplacian. Yeah. That's really what I'm doing here. So that operator here corresponds to a Laplacian. I'm looking at the kernel because really I'm looking at harmonic representatives. Mm -hmm. I'm not performing a quotient construction here like I would for cohomology. I'm actually working on the harmonic representatives from the start. I see. So that's very confusing if you try to translate between the different pictures because on the left-hand side, it's much more natural to work with cohomology. And on the right-hand side, I haven't really done that. Although you could of course translate everything in that language. It must be equivalent to what I, what I did here. Thank you. Um, and just... Um... So this is just uh, trying to work. I mean, so in the beginning, you uh, told us that the elliptic genus can be, uh, I mean, it's constructed for uh, any vector bundle over a compact uh, complex manifold. So this uh, MathCal E M tau Z. Yeah, I mean, so you can replace T star by any uh, vector bundle, right? Uh, as you do over here for any bundle oh, E over M. No, no, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't know how to call this. Probably you can do this, but I don't actually don't know what the properties are. So you call it the elliptic genus when you um, use the holomorphic tangent bundle here. And I actually don't know. Of course, you can do this. You can write out an expression like this and probably you'll get an interesting invariant, but I don't actually know what its properties are because somewhere along the way, I crucially used that M as a Calabial manifold. So I used some uh, information here, but yeah, formally you can do that. I just did said for any bundle right here because I need to introduce this um, notation in general. Okay. I, on the face of it, I'm only using T and T star in here later on. 
but that's a great idea and i don't even know how to translate that into yeah, okay so i will just tell you why i was asking this it's a, a rational conformal field theory um according to friedan schenker gives us a, a holomorphic uh, vector bundle on the moduli space of curves which extends to its compactification as well yes and uh, there's a vector i mean there's such a vector bundle for every level k so i was wondering if uh, one could uh, compute its elliptic genus and if it's uh, something interesting that sounds interesting it's, it's, and it's a topological invariant of uh, mg really yeah yeah as I said, I don't really know what happens if you replace T by other bundles yeah. here. So, so one can make it simpler. And instead of looking at the Verlinda bundle or some conformal field theory, one can just look at the cotangent bundle of MG, mm -hmm. which is basically just the space of uh, holomorphic quadratic differentials and do this computation. But over there, you don't have that M is a Calabi-Yau. At least I don't think the moduli, yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, a moduli space of curves is not Calabi-Yau. At no. least, or I just, no, definitely for genus is uh, one, so. Well, maybe you don't need to care because maybe you don't need this nice modular property. If you do the um, uh, the calculation for the transformation properties here, you will see, okay, well, then there's some anomaly um, introduced if C1 doesn't man but vanish, but it is actually still rather well under control. So um, I'm particularly interested in these Calabial manifolds, but you can write this equation and have still pretty good properties, even if C1 doesn't match. Vanish. So um, that wouldn't hold me back of, from uh, trying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you won't have a weak Jacobi form, but you will have something that uh, still um, behaves in a manageable way under modular transformations. Very much so in uh, terms of the. You expect uh, some. You do expect some invariance under S and T matrices, even when C one M is non-vanishing. Uh, well, the T matrix will work. Without trouble, I say yeah, S matrix, you will get some prefactor, you will get some Z dependent prefactor, which isn't there um, for C1. So it's lin, it's an ex exponential of Z times C1, something like that. And of course, some multiple, I mean, some power of that. Yeah, so it could be actually that it's a modular form for a congruent subgroup yeah. of a level equal to yeah. uh, the churn number. Exactly, that could be, that would, that sounds quite likely. Yeah. Well, no, because you have uh, arbitrary. Z. Well, that's <laughs> anyway. It's an interesting question, and it's not completely. It's not completely horrendous what you get if C one is not equal to zero. It's still pretty much under control. You just need right. to use the standard transformation properties for the theta function, and then you can check. Right, but the modularity has to do with the fact that you have an underlying conformal field theory, right? Well. From my point of view, of course, but uh, from this approach here, no conformal field theory entered into No, no, of course not, but I, that's opposed to oh, my, Yes, of course, conformal field theory for, for, right. for everything. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If you had a bundle, I suppose you'd want to write down a, a conformal field theory that has that bundle as a background field somehow, right? Yes, yes. Right, yes. you want to do That something. could be open a door to constructing new conformal field theories. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay. um, one, I mean, just because I've uh, been, um, so in the case of uh, elliptically fibered K3 surfaces, mm -hmm. um, actually an even easier example, um, if you have a Belian surface, which is a product of two elliptic curves, mm -hmm. um, you look at the elliptic uh, Genus or the, I mean, you basically get in my simple naive world, you somehow cook up a Jacobi uh, modular form associated with that. And now, if you t dualize one of the elliptic curves and try to do the same thing, do you get the same uh, uh, Jacobi modular form? Or, in other words, uh, is the BPS spectrum uh, the same for the abelian surface and the t dualized abelian surface? And you can, of course, play the same game with the elliptically fibered K3 and apply T duality to each uh, fiber. Yeah, I'd prefer to work with elliptically fibered K3s because for a complex tori, all, everything is zero a priori. Okay. So, well, yes, okay. of course, it's the same result, but for different reasons from what you said. Um, for K3, 
well, anyway, I mean, if, so the variant is in, invariant for K3 surfaces, so it's the same for every K3 surface. I see. It does not depend. That's that's uh, yeah. That that's important here. It does not depend on the complex structure, or I mean, we never chose a metric anyway. But a well, it's a topological thing. That's yeah. right. And um, invariant. Yeah. yeah. And I guess under mirror symmetry, at least for K3 surfaces, there's no change in topology. So. Yeah, but coming from the CFT point of view, mirror symmetry also shouldn't change the result, even if you go to higher dimensions, because the uh -huh. CFT shouldn't change. Under oh, okay, good. So that's what I was looking for. If, for yeah. example, you were playing the same game with the Calabi out threefold, or it's mirror dual, your answer remains the same. Yeah, I also have a refined version of this elliptic genus. Dif I mean, different. Also, you could formulate it in terms of equivariance, but it's not the topic of this talk. And uh, there, actually, mirror symmetry then boils down to swapping one of the parameters, because mirror symmetry on the face of it, of course, is uh, in the CFT language, is, say, swapping the sign of J0 tilde. So you may see some effect in the function there, but a trivial one, as in just swapping the sign of one of the mm -hmm. arguments. That can happen. I see. Okay, well, great. I guess um, if there are more, more questions, maybe we should thank Katrin again, whoever is remaining. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank her so much for the great talk. And uh, I hope you get some rest now. It's late at night, right? <laughs> I deserve it. Okay. Thank you. It was my pleasure. It was okay, nice have a good night. Bye.